Final Crown Insider Edition of Horse Racing Nation's webcast series. I am Brian Zipsy, and tonight I have the great pleasure of being joined by one of the hottest young riders in the country. Can we still call you a young rider, or should I just say one of the hottest riders in the country? This is Florent Charoux to my left. To his left is his agent. Of course, uh, Doug Bradar was a racing secretary at Churchill Downs, Louisiana. Died. A lot of them does. Seven different places. Seven different racetracks. Now, uh, together, the two have kind of taken racing by storm the last few years. And of course, I'm, as always, I'm joined by Joe Christofek, horse racing personality from Churchill Downs. Joe, two, good, two great guests tonight. Let's talk Preakness. Let's talk Derby. Let's talk a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, the first question, obviously, for Ferran and Doug is gun runner. I mean, you guys ran third. Uh, Florent, you were on the lead, you know, at the top of the stretch before Nyquist came and got you, and then exaggerated or passed you late. Um, let's talk about that experience. I mean, you had been through a couple of preps in Louisiana, wondering how this horse is going to fit in with horses from all over the country, wondering what kind of trip you were going to get. Are you satisfied with this performance? Yes, really. That was a um, that was a great place, you know, a very uh, unique, you know. Uh, Especially, you know, fields wise, you know, it's a big field and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the race, you know. And um, no, we walked out a good trip, you know, uh, from a good post. And uh, my horse, you know, at uh, very good uh, tactical speed, I was able to put him in a good position, you know, uh, right off the bed. And yeah, we had a good trade, you know, from the three to the quarter pole until night quick, you know, uh, got me uh, on top of the stretch. And um, no, I think uh, my horse went. Uh, Hard out, you know, and hold on for third, which was huge. And Doug, getting this mount, I mean, we're going to talk about the rapid ascent from this man to your right, because I've got some statistics from a few years back when you guys first hooked up up until now, where he's the sixth leading rider in the country. Well, let's talk about securing the mount on Gunrunner. Obviously, you guys are riding now a lot for Steve Asmussen. Uh, Ricardo Santana rode this horse towards the end of last year. You picked up the mount. How does that happen? Do you have discussions with Steve? Do you go to Steve and say, hey, I think Ferrant fits this horse really well? And in the back of your mind, when you secure this mod on Gunrunner months in advance, are you thinking dirty? Well, you, you never really think too far down the road. These horses, uh, who was that, Charlie Whittingham? They're like strawberries, they go, uh, they go bad real quickly. So you, you don't really try, not, you never try to like, this is my derby mount. But obviously when we were able to secure the mount, and that's through communication with uh, Steve, his assistant, Scott Blasi, Florent is wonderful at helping us get horses as well. So we, we were under the understanding that they were going to, you know, get offered to us. We were thrilled to death. We knew he was a really nice animal. And uh, the horse has run phenomenal. I mean, he gave uh, at least myself, my wife, Caitlin, and all of Florent's family one heck of a thrill for five, at least five or ten seconds at the top of the stretch. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a thrill. These wins, uh, they never get old. They're, they're as good as it gets. That's almost like a win running third. Without a doubt, without a doubt. When he held on for third, uh, I thought just complete perseverance on his part. And... Uh, I know the connections were, were very happy with hanging out for third. From Doug's perspective, that's interesting, but I want to know, Florent, uh, you're on the turn, you're maybe between the three eighths ball and the quarter ball, and the thought comes creeping into your mind that you might win the Kentucky Derby. What, no one, there's not a lot of people out there that know what that feeling is like. Can you tell us a little bit what was going through your mind as you're riding? Him on the turn into the stretch? Uh, to be honest, no, I don't really remember, you know, but just like uh, very briefly said, okay, uh, I may have a shot to win it, you know, but uh, uh, at the time, you know, during the race, you know, really thinking like, you, we still pretty far, you know, we had uh, uh, three, eight points, you know, 600 meters uh, still to do uh, to the wire, but no, I'm looking at my wrist and he's looking at me and we're both uh, moving right along and uh, at this time, we don't even know which one is best, you know. And uh, but telling for home, you know, when he cut loose, you know, his horse, uh, his horse shows uh, another acceleration, you know, and mine just keep uh, clipping along, you know. And um, no, it was great. I was just uh, very happy, you know, uh, to have a good trip, you know, with any um, uh, difficulties, you know, uh, going into the first turn, like uh, 
being bumped around or anything like this, you know, and uh, the main thing is make sure the horse, you know, come back, you know, in one piece and come back good and healthy and it's a long year, you know, and who knows, we might uh, catch him later on the road. What about the week leading up to the Derby and for Doug and Florent, all these horses coming from California, New York, Florida, and most of them hadn't faced each other. You're trying to fit, figure out exactly where you fit in. And the New Orleans prep races the last few, several years haven't been very fruitful. And you talk about speed figures, and you talk about competition. Where did you guys think you fit in with everybody? Were you really confident going into the race that you, know, you would run as well as you did? Yeah, I thought I had good shots, you know, uh, like you said, you know, we are maybe a little bit lower, you know, on the buyer and numbers or rights or whatever, you know, but uh, with one thing for us, you know, uh, the horse is very manageable and it was good tactical speed and I think by the near the numbers or whatever you have in the war, you know, and uh, if you have no speed and you get uh, bumped around and shuffled back or shut off or anything happened, uh, your race is pretty over, you know, even if you have like a... Great horse who's running huge buyers. Uh, if you don't have the trip, uh, it's a big problem. And um, no, I think uh, everything worked out great, you know, for us, you know, um, especially in you know, like development of the race. And from there, I just try to have like a good uh, being positive, you know, and try to to do my best, you know, at the end. This horse seems to be uh, perhaps an easier horse to ride than some. I mean, his. His position as they're turning for home in the Kentucky Derby is kind of a mirror image to almost every race that we've seen from Conrad, where he is just getting in good position together with you, getting in a good position time and time again. Is he an easier horse to ride than, than some of the other tougher horses to ride, maybe, uh, that you have uh, uh, going right now? He might, I don't know, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I just get along with him too. I, I have no idea, but I know him know very well now, you know, because I have the chance to breathe him, you know. Um, Breathing pretty much every week, you know, before uh, he's getting into a race, you know. I've been on his back since uh, December, and I don't remember, or maybe only a few breezes when I don't breathe him, but uh, it's time to know him very well, you know, so it's, uh, it's always good when you know the horse very well. And um, now from there, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe just a good relationship with the horse, I guess. There you go. Now, the Doug, uh, is there is there a point as a jockey agent, as a as a as a top notch jockey agent, where you're thinking, get the best horses possible, or maybe some horses that might fit your rider a little bit better than other horses? Well, I mean, you, you're you're only going to be able to get uh, horses you draw from the, the people that you know are going to use you. Uh, as Florent has ascended up the ladder, I find that calls to people that hardly even know me or him are a lot easier to make. But I mean, typically, uh, right now I'm working pretty hard on the, the Pimlico races for Preakness weekend, and a lot of them just, some of them fall into your lap. He worked a whole bunch of horses on Monday at Churchill, and we get some of the um, calls on those horses. In the races that we don't have calls, I, I looked at them today, actually, it just uh, came online. So you, you study them pretty closely, you look and you, you understand pretty quickly that uh, horse A, you might be able to ride, horse B, you probably have no chance whatsoever. So, you know, you're looking at uh, who's Javier been on, who's Johnny Velasquez been on, who, you know, who other riders have been on. And I, as you do this, you'll learn certain tricks of the trade. And obviously one is, you know, if Javier's been on two or three of them, you can only ride one of the race. So, you know, you look at certain things and you develop relationships with certain people. So right, yeah, right now I've got a lot of calls out uh, to people to try and uh, maximize our Mount Sun Preakness weekend. So let's take that one step further and talk about almost specifically about the dirt. So you've got Florent, you said like, you know, the last couple of years become more prominent, getting business to become easier because he's made, made such a name for himself, winning Breeders' Cup races, so on and so forth. But there are guys around that have won derbies that performed in multiple Kentucky Derbies, multiple grade one races, big name riders. When it comes to a race like the Derby and you have a mount, you could be on the side of it where you're trying to protect that mount because other guys are going to be your trainers. And at the same time, you're trying to get the best possible mount 
for a race like the Derby as well. So how do you walk that line of this is my Derby mount or potentially moving forward as the years go on, maybe I can improve my Derby mount? Right. Uh, I think what it comes down to more than anything is that you you feel comfortable, I, I know I do feel comfortable dealing with certain trainers and owners and connections and just as Florent feels super comfortable you know, riding certain horses or this or that. So I think that more often than not, you're, you're better off if, if, if we get in a position where we suddenly start riding every derby prep out there and win about three or four of them or all six of them, you know, you, you would reach a point where that, then this is, this is a brutal, difficult decision. But right now, I mean, for us this year in particular, uh, people knew that we were kind of tied to Gunrunner. I mean, he kept winning. Uh, it was a great relationship. It is a great relationship. And uh, we, we didn't even have him out in the, uh, the bluegrass because uh, I think a lot of people just knew if their horse you know, ran a great race, we were taken. So I think there's just certain scenarios and things, but you know, when you look at any race that's out there right now, yeah, we, we obviously take a, a good, long, hard look at the ones we've been riding, but if, if we don't feel that they're quite good enough, yeah, absolutely look at the whole nomination list. And I mean, I don't really want to put him on, you know, long shots, and I don't think he wants to ride long shots. So, you know, we're we're always looking for the best horse, but there's there's you know a lot of circumstances that go into it too. Well, Florent, your distance in the Derby is a mile and a quarter, which is the first time any of them besides Lonnie have gone that far. Uh, you won in a mile and an eighth in the Louisiana Derby with Gun Runner, but moving forward into the end of his three-year-old year, progressively and then potentially next year, what do you think his absolute best dis distance is? What is his best trip? Or do you not know that yet? Uh, I don't know that yet, you know, to be honest. You know, we said, oh, the minor quarter might be a step, you know, a little bit long for him. Might, might not, but I was forward in place and we went a hot pace. So, of course, you know, we finished a little bit slower than some others. You know, even uh, Nyquist did, you know. The only one finished, you know, that was uh, exaggerated, you know, but he come from far back, he started. The race a little bit slower and finish faster, you know, but was supposed to. And um, now I don't know yet. Uh, it's better to go to go very to go to go long, you know. And building wise, you know, it looks like he could get the minor part. It was not the problem, you know. But maybe it might be a step too long for him, or might not, you know. Uh, that's a question I think he's going to answer, you know, in the next uh, few months, you know. Hopefully, with a couple of more races, you know, uh, under his belt, and from there we make the decision, you know, and also, you know, uh, Steve has mentioned, you know, uh, he's going to make the right decision for the horse, you know, he's a great horseman, and he knows what to do, you know, I'm just, I'm just a pilot, basically. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's yeah. a product, too, of the horse horses racing against. That's true. Right. Yeah, it's true. Obviously, I don't know the horse as well as Florent does, but Joe, I think I can answer that question pretty well. What's best for gun runner is, is nine furlongs, say, late January at Gulfstream Park next year, going after a, uh, a little purse uh, of about $12 million. What do you think, guys? Is that, is that, a, is that a race that might set up well for Gun Runner, the, uh, the, the newly formed Pegasus Cup? Well, it could be, you know, uh, if he's uh, <laughs> still you know, healthy and doing great, you know? And, uh, you know, that's a, I have no thought, you know, whatsoever, uh, saying he's going to run or not, you know, uh, the trainer and the owner first, you know, made a decision to, to run or not, you know? And, they are the one who need to pull up you know, with the money of the of the nomination, you know, which is pretty pretty big, you know, for this race this time. Pretty steep. He's got a lot. Doug's got a lot of thoughts going through his head right now. Yeah, I think we should talk about this a little, folks. In case you haven't heard, the Pegasus Cup was announced today. It is the twelve million dollar brainchild of the Stronic Group, uh, French Stronic. They're gonna they're gonna have a twelve million dollar race at Gulfstream Park, where each of the twelve entrance would have to put up a million dollars to get into the race. Thoughts, Doug? Uh, it's a, a steep uh, entry and starting fee, I'll say that much. Uh, it's a unique concept. It, it certainly, it could go, it, it could fly. I, I, I'd be very surprised if they get 12 horses in the race. Uh, I think once uh, a couple of the bigger names actually did decide to put their million dollars up, 
uh, it would be they'd be hard pressed to get another. If six of them, the best horses in the country, put their money up, I'd be surprised if there's six more out there that'll do it. But you never know. Maybe Who's going to be around us too? Right, right exactly. It's, it's pure speculation yeah. on whether or not uh, California Chrome makes it through the year. All these three-year-olds, if Nyquist uh, sweeps the Triple Crown and then pulls off what's it called, the Grand Slam that uh, American Pharaoh did last year. But it's just so far out there. But I mean, maybe, maybe there's hardly anybody left. And there's a lot of people out there that feel a million dollar investment is, is worth their while. And um, they'll take a shot. But I, I'd be very surprised if this, this thing ends up with a 12 horse field. Well, let's, let's rewind a little bit and talk a little bit about the Preakness moving forward. Uh, big field of possibles. Um, Gunrunner is one of those that has been named a possible on the fence right now. Uh, Doug Ferran, what can you tell us about you know, his potential status in the Preakness and maybe what he would need to do either in that race or moving forward to turn the tables on Nyquist, all things being equal? Well, I saw Gunrunner uh, come on the track today. He did make it for his first uh, trip around there. He looked great. Uh, it's, once again, like Florence said, it, it, we have nothing to do with that decision. Uh, I believe the connections uh, I read in a tweet are going to make that decision in the very near future. So probably Thursday or Friday they'll make a call. I mean, the one thing about the Preakness, it comes up very, very quick. Yeah. And Florence, I mean, this is your mom, right? So you obviously want to do what's best by the horse and not jam the horse potentially back into the Preakness and have a good year because three-year-old season is where you can make money with a horse. You're running against strictly three-year-olds. As you run into older competition, it gets a little tougher. Yeah, no, true, but uh, in the meanwhile, you know, the Preakness is still uh, 1.5 million, which is uh, pretty big, you know, to find that uh, right now, you know? Uh, no, I think it's uh, still how the horse come back, you know, uh, I'm sure, you know, they have uh, they have a plan B, you know, if uh, the plan A uh, doesn't work out, you know, if they feel it's a little bit too quick and the horse needs a little more time to recover. Uh, like you said, you know, there's plenty of uh, races you know, left, you know, uh, this summer, you know. What about uh, that clucking noise he makes? Is that a state of acid reflux or what? No, I think it's when the, when you get uh, pulled a little bit, you know, he makes a little bit of noise, but I don't think it's nothing. So it hasn't proven it yet. You know, like, uh, go said, oh, hey, what's that noise, you know? Uh, he almost made it, and I don't think it's, it's bad, and of course he, he did run away in the derby, you know, if he was making some crazy noise, which is, uh, can't help, you know, he's, uh, he's breathing, he would have uh, stopped uh, very quickly, but uh, I wasn't worried, you know, before coming into the race, and, and worked out good because we didn't stop, you know, from making that weird noise. One of the early, uh, loudest horses I saw work last year was a horse called Run Happy. And uh, when, when I saw him early in the year making a lot of noise, just breezing, you got to wonder, it makes you wonder what's, what's going on with the horse. And then, of course, Run Happy went on to have a pretty good year and doesn't seem to be bothering Gun Runner a little bit. Maybe now's a good time, Joe. Why don't we watch that Kentucky Derby that we had Saturday, the 142nd running, won by Nyquist, of course, exaggerator second, and Florent Giroux. And gun runner third. The last horse is moving into the starting gate here. It's Dan Handy, Smith, expected front runner in this field of coming out of 17. They're off, they're off in the Kentucky Derby. Quest has been Lonnie pulled his away last. Dan Candy on the far side is out. It's gun runner side. Night was between these two. Work is and then comes. By more spirit on the far outside. More after that. In versus is an Oscar nominated next one left to run. And then follow the inside. Oh Hayne is racing about ten off the line of the inside. Turn right alongside Brody's cause. Five left to my time. It's Ken DeSormo well off the pace here. Then Smoke on he's gone. Create another five. Then Sunbrand News and Last I was in five and three seconds and Zing Candy wings up the back stretch in front, setting a solid pace which could help these late closers here. Zing Candy in front by half links under Mike Smith with one run running and on the inside. Did Nike their third to the outside? They give it two to work in Victor is on the four. They're four and a half links off the lead. It's Tom Destin nominated as the 
field makes their way around the fart. Quarters went and and it is dancing candy in front by an egg and people around and, and then the fart turn. Iquan is right in ten and he's runner. Four length get back to Destin. Rallied in third. It is coming and they're into the stretch and it's Nyquist. Question, you know, uh, 
people uh, question him about it, you know. A lot of people didn't know about the distance, if he was good enough, if a lot of little things, you know, but uh, I think he answered uh, plenty of questions, you know, last time. What do you think? How good is he? He's a nice animal. I mean, any horse that continues to win and is undefeated uh, deserves a lot of respect. And, and as much as people were trying to, to take shots at him all week, and I mean, I, I was just shocked at the, the amount of people, you know, that I respect that, that did not pick Nyquist to win the Derby. And a lot of that has to do with just trying to be creative, true, trying to go true. against the fame. Like, for me, I mean, I went with Farrell last year and Chrome the year before. For some reason, I didn't have the same kind of feeling about Nyquist, but you know, there's re do you go into it thinking Nyquist is the best? I did. But at the same time, you're looking at 18 to 1 on some of these horses. Oh, that's tough. You're trying right? to cash it back. Yeah, I mean, instead yeah. of looking at it from a perspective of just logic, you're looking at it value. And there was a tremendous amount of value. But unfortunately, oh, yeah, after the race, there was very little. Well. I mean, I, I think somebody said it, it's just like rare, but one of the first times that the first four favorites ran one, two, three, four. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just hard to believe. And I mean, I, I had a $20 exacta, a $20 trifecta, and the superfecta, and I almost lost money on the race. Yeah. $30 exacta in the derby. Yeah. Yeah. 20 horse field, I, I don't know that we'll ever see one, two, three, four finish yeah. that way again. That's, yeah. that's, that's amazing. I think my handicapping was illogical. Yeah. Uh, just trying to beat the favorite. Yeah, it, it, we, we talked about Nyquist as the most likely winner, but we were all trying to, to, to catch a horse with a little bit better odds or, or be right with a horse that can beat uh, Nyquist. Is anybody picking against Nyquist? I mean, it sounds like the four of us are all on the Nyquist camp at uh, on maybe four to five in the Preakness. Is there somebody that we think can, can well, beat him or is he the horse? I think you need to look at, you know, the race to get drawn and uh, does it end up with eight horses or does the, you know, the gate get filled with 14? And once again, who draws 1-2, who draws 12-13-14? The top turns are, I believe, a little tighter than mm -hmm. other places. So, you know, some of those spots might not be real advantageous. So. And, and I mean, I don't, I don't believe Nyquist works before the race, from what I've heard. Yeah. They're just going to uh, gallop and jog him into it. But, you know, some of the other ones will obviously work on probably Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you want to see if they're, you know, still maintaining their form, if they ran in the Derby, or if they're a new shooter, you know, how they react. Florence, did you get any feeling of, uh, of an exaggerator and, and what kind of uh, run he was really making in the Derby as he uh, was able to go by in the stretch? Yeah, I did, you know, uh, look like a horse, you know, especially on the paper, look like when he starts riding, I'm like, wow, my, <laughs> it might be the winner, you know, but uh, when he starts riding, uh, I didn't rule all his chances, you know, but I think it's a horse who have been really, really tough, you know, if uh, the truck would have been uh, listed as sloppy or anything. But um, he's almost actually, I've walked in the a few times uh, last year, so I knew him a little bit. Uh, very nice horse, and... You know, he was coming into the race you know, in good form and he had high expectation, you know, from uh, Kent and his uh, brother kids, you know, and he ran like uh, they thought he would. Did you work him at uh, Keeneland uh, last year? Or? Yeah, I did, yeah. Keeneland, yeah. Before the Breeders' Cup. Yeah. Of course, he was fourth in the Breeders' Cup and now second in the Derby. Uh, Exaggerator looks like uh, pretty sure that he's going to be in the Preakness in a pretty clear second choice. No offense to, to Gunrunner, possibly, or Stradivari, but. Uh, Exaggerated goes into the Derby. Is is he is he a horse that you think might have a better shot to uh, upset the Nyquist Triple Crown Trail one race farther on in the Belmont, or do you think uh, Nyquist might be more vulnerable right away back in the Preakness? Yeah, that, that's the way you you might think. You know, uh, the Belmont. You know, him or uh, Saint and uh, Broken News. You know, horses deep closer who looks like um, they are asking you know for more distance. You know. But you know, sometimes uh, they run mine half and they run the same way as when they run mine a quarter or mine eight. But yeah, it would be interesting you know, to see them uh, running the Belmont if they are still around you know, uh, for the race. Let's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit and give everyone a little bit more background in your introduction that you mentioned about Florent, about Doug, and obviously they've been uh, jockey and agent partnership for several years now. Uh, Florent, 
you're from France, uh, you began writing when you were 17, uh, you moved to California in 2007, you had some visa problems and you were injured and you wound up coming back. And, you know, the beginning of your career, I, mean, I was at Arlington, and I'm just going to read some stats because the numbers pretty much tell the story. 2008, you had 17 wins from 206 miles and 350,000 in purse earnings, um, which probably takes you a weekend these days. Uh, 2009 improvement, only about a 10% rider, but you got up to 1.2 million. Very similar year in 2010. 2011, you made a nice jump, 146 wins, more than double any of your other win totals, almost triple, up to 3.2 million. Then 2014 is really when you took a step forward. Uh, 5.8 million, you won the Breeders' Cup on work all week. 2015, 10.1, uh, 10.2 million, 13th in the country. And right now you've earned almost $5 million in purses already, uh, second week of May, 21% winners, sixth in the nation. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to Doug because obviously Doug has seen almost all of these rides. Where has your improvement come from? Is it confidence? Is it, you can say it's the horses you're riding, which is a big part of it. But I personally, and I know I've told you this myself two years ago, when you took that next step, and I could see it in your riding, where did the improvement come from? Because you're the man now. Who takes it, you or me? Well, I mean, I'd like to hear both of your perspectives. You know what, you know what I heard so, a couple years ago? Somebody told me, I don't know if they were joking, but they said Florent Giroux really can ride the Illinois Prince. And, and I think they were talking about work all week and, and a few others from Wilmington. Is it, is it Illinois Prep that got you going? Is that? Uh... Uh, it started there because it, uh, it started uh, at Arlington, you know, basically. And I got you know, super lucky to write some very nice uh, Illinois Prep, you know, uh, work all week and the pizza man and uh, some tracer or a big race on and I'm sure some others, you know, I play for it. Blocks are trusting you more. On a day to day basis, right? Yes, you know, and you know what? He didn't even start you know, in those races, to be honest. Uh, he started probably like, I would say, 2011 when I was trying to ride, you know, uh, pretty much every horse for Roger Brueggemann and Milos Thorbred, and for that point, who we were clipping along pretty good, you know, at, uh, at Hawthorne, winning a lot of races, and for sure he gets some confidence, you know, because everything they, they run, you know, are very live, you know. Are, uh, Roger put them in a very good spot and me to explore, but I'm not afraid of losing the horses if they have to, you know, so they are 9 to 5 or who knows, even sometimes uh, lower odds, you know, and we just keep winning. And from then we start winning, you know, some of the um, stakes, you know, eating on bread stakes, you know, state bread, and it started like this, you know, and I was, I win pretty much every, you know, stakes, you know. I'm thinking of, you know, at Hawthorne and Arlington. And from there, you know, we start winning a great stakes, you know, here and there. And now, you know, we just have the opportunity to ride uh, some good one pretty much every weekend. Dude, you're so matter of fact about it. But are you the same jockey you were in 2008 when you had 17 wins? What, I mean, well, same jockey, uh, I would say Yes and no, but uh, I have more experience now, you know, riding here, especially in the U U.S., you know, because when I first came, uh, I never rode a horse in my life on the dirt. Uh, so, of course, you know, it's going to take a while to uh, get uh, acclimated. But uh, I also have a lot of uh, riding experience, you know, uh, from my previous years, you know, riding in, uh, in Europe, you know, and now when I take a look at that, you know, uh, I have a little better knowledge, you know, probably of the pace, and Right, the turf races probably leave it, you know, not smaller or better than the other, but have some like knowledge and people here in the States uh, don't have, you know. Uh, they only been riding, you know, uh, uh, left handed, uh, really, you know, uh, right handed and straight course a uh, thousand of times, you know, so I think it's could be a uh, great, you know, who knows for the future if I have to go uh, somewhere else, you know, for a big race, you know, like. Uh, in England or in Asia or who knows, you know. Right. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll travel. Doug, Doug, you said something very interesting during the break that our uh, audience, viewing audience missed, and that was that uh, you've watched the Derby now over and over and over again. 
and all you can do is watch gun runner. You mean to watch other parts of the race, but you're transfixed on on your man. It, it happens a lot, and it really does. Because I'll I'll try really hard to watch. Uh, another horse in the race or somebody else that, you know, and, and most times you, you are able to do that. I mean, a, a, a six or a seven or an eight horse field, you're going to be able to see everybody pretty easily. But no, I think just to get back on what we were elaborating on, uh, there's been stages. I mean, when when we first got together, it was then Pickens. I mean, we, it was very challenging. How did you get together? Um, what was, what I, did you see, did you why, see something in him? Yeah, or was he the jock available that I, you could get? I had, you know, kind of run my course of, of, of working for race tracks and I, my entire career I've been a racing official and I was getting kind of burnt out by that and looking to try something different and in a chance encounter I, I ran into Patrick Biancone uh, in an elevator at Gulfstream Park. We were both, I believe, heading up to the restaurant up there, Christine Lee's. And uh, I just mentioned to him, hey, uh, I'm thinking of trying something different. I want to maybe be an agent. And, and I said, here's my number. You, you know how to get a hold of me. You have mutual friends. Call me if something develops. And I mean, it, it was about 24 hours. And he called and said, you need to come by the barn at break time uh, and meet somebody. And I was under the impression I was going to shake somebody's hand maybe or and that we would go out to dinner or lunch, you know, and talk about stuff. And I, I believe Patrick told him, you know, if this guy's available, you gotta take him. He's he's been a racing secretary, he knows everyone, he gets along with everyone pretty well. And uh, this is a great opportunity for you, Florence. So uh, after we shook hands, it was basically like when do we get started? So I, I mean I always saw a lot of potential in Florent. I mean I, he's a smart kid. I call him a kid, but he could be my kid, he's 29, I'm, I'm old enough to certainly have had him, but uh, Kate and I, <laughs> but uh, no, he, um, he always was sharp, he always, uh, and I mean, we just had to work on his English and make sure that he communicated a little bit better, and as we went through stages, I mean, one that was really important was one that he embarked on, you know, that he spoke about was the Midwest uh, fall meet at Hawthorne, where we were put on sprinters and routers and dirt and turf, and he ran and rode in slop and bad conditions, cold weather, and I mean, he he started getting good. I mean, he really did. He he, he adapted. He, he learned, you know, do this, don't do that. Uh, this jockey's going to probably be sending. That jockey's going to be laying back, and, and he has a keen sense of what's going on, and then as he got better, his, his development of pace got so much better. Uh, you know, he just, he gets in the zone. And uh, we put it, we started getting him on better and better mounts. And he, it's as if he has uh, ice in his veins. I mean, the, the better races, even when we were hardly riding very many good races, when I sent him out of town to ride in a stake, I mean, he would nine out of 10 times do everything right. And he's continued to do that as we, we climb up the ladder and go from, you know, Illinois bread stakes or Pennsylvania bread stakes to, you know, grade threes or listed stakes to now grade ones. And it, it's, it's just an incredible uh, ascension. And uh, I think we're both, uh, we make a good team. He, he gives me feedback. I give him some. When, when we're in agreement, we usually make the right decision. And... Uh, it's it's been a, an incredible run. I mean, I I put together five Kentucky Derbies. I put together Arlington Millions, Breeders Cups. I, I've I had a very distinguished career as a racing official. But winning races with him is, is more fun than doing anything else. I mean, I, I I get it's it's just an incredible thrill when we win these big races. I mean, I, I think he'll agree when we won the Arlington Million last year in the Pizza Man. I mean, it was. It was as good as it gets. I mean, I, I grew up in Illinois, and he has a fondness of in his heart with Illinois and his, you know, the family that his wife Casey and all of their family were, were all from Illinois breads. Mostly, he's the French bread, but we, uh, I mean, it was it was just special. I mean, that that win was as good as the first Breeders Cup win, and then we knocked off two Breeders Cups last year. So it's it's been amazing. It really has. I, I pinch myself sometimes. I mean, the, the meet that we had at Kentucky Downs last fall and uh, the, the great day that we just had on Kentucky Oaks Day, it's, it's special.
really is. I think we all were uh, pretty happy with the result in uh, last year's Arlington Million scene. Uh, Flo ran a lot to ride the Pizza Man to victory. The Pizza Man is uh, on the shelf right now doing a little R&R, &R, but we hope to see the excellent Illinois bred gelding back, uh, written by Florent Charoux in the near future, and uh, maybe another run at that Arlington Million. Are you embarrassed by all these compliments that you're getting, or are you getting used to hearing all these uh, glowing words about your uh, riding ability and, and, and how you've become such a top rider in the country in a short amount of time? No, I'm not embarrassed, you know, but uh, I need to always, you know, uh, make sure, you know, I keep uh, going uh, forward, you know, to the right direction and make sure it's not like, okay, uh, now I'm the best and uh, anything can happen to me because I have saw, you know, myself and from, you know, people who told me, uh, I mean, it's very easy to go to the top, but it's even easier to go uh, down to the bottom. So, no, I need to make sure you always keep walking hard and just uh, treat people you know, uh, the right way and ride you know, as hard as you can and from there uh, hopefully things can get uh, better and better. I know it's hard to think if I get better when like... Two Breeders' Cup wins? Yeah, you know, those kind of things like this, but uh, you know, when in my first year, you know, I was in like a 140 race or something and like five years earning, I'm like, wow, if I do that next year, you know, I, I sign it right away and I double it, you know, and I ever could imagine I was going to do it again. And even last year, I'm like, oh, I win five grade one, I hit a million in Breeders' Cup races. If I do that again, I'd be very happy, you know, and so far, look like I might do again, you know, that, uh, that same year, you know, I didn't win any grade one yet this year. I'm working on it, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> You are working on it. In fact, I think uh, up until this point where we were less than halfway through the year, you were just about halfway to your $10 million in earnings last year. Uh, last I checked, it was just a, maybe a hair below $5 million already this year, so the beat goes on. Yeah, and what's interesting too is obviously you know, you're securing all of these mounts at this high level. We talked about some of your stats from a few years ago. Did you ever get frustrated? Did you ever say, you know, maybe I need to make a change. You were riding at Arlington. Obviously, you met your wife to be there, and that kind of became your home. And now you've kind of pulled up your tack, and Kentucky is your home base. But back there in the lean years, did you ever think to yourself, you know, maybe I'm going to go back home? Did you ever get frustrated? No, not really. No, uh, why Lina was there, you know, in Chicago, and felt happy, you know, just being with my wife, you know, in a family, I felt very comfortable, and uh, even when I was doing, you know, uh, one million earnings, I was able to pay my bills, and just I was, I was happy, you know, when you can pay your bills, and you need about, like, thinking, you know, about money, uh, from there, it's all good, but, uh, no, I just wanted to prove myself, and prove also maybe to others, uh, I could do it, you know, if you give me the right horse, and, I will be able to take the, the challenges, but um, no, from there I was, I was pretty excited when I started winning and finally, you know, like, winning, you know, the biggest level, you know, even in, uh, in the Midwest at, uh, in Chicago, and when I won pretty much every big race, you know, you have to win, uh, you know, in uh, Arlington, it's when decide, you know, what we should do next, you know, it's when I start thinking, now that's when I should leave, you know, uh, being based at the fairground, you know, for a few winters. We knew, you know, a lot of trainers, you know, are based at uh, Churchill Down. And that's when uh, we decided to make the move, you know. We could have made the move actually last year, but we just stayed, you know, you know what, let's, let's stay over there another year because I didn't want to move my family around without, you know, being telling them and make sure, you know, I do things, you know, uh, properly. And um, worked out pretty good because we won you know, a few days a week, you know, uh, in Arlington, and pretty much every weekend we are going, you know, somewhere and clean up, you know, some steaks, some great steaks, you know, pretty much everywhere in the country. And um, plus, you know, with the the joy and happiness to win the uh, Arlington Million, you know, so that was the cherry pretty much on the cake, you know. One thing I was maybe not disappointed, but I would love, you know, to win at least 
the uh, running time, or even at least one time in Arlington Park, you know, because I call it my home track, but I don't think it was I could make it, you know, last year, you know, because uh, we've been going, you know, so much, and the year before, same thing, you know, so it's when you want to win town, you need to say, okay, uh, I might sacrifice, you know, some better horses out of town, but I'm going to stay here every uh, weekend and try to win as much uh, races as uh, we could, you know, but um, no, looking at back now, you know, I'm just hoping you know, to have like a good business now, you know, church down and winning a lot of races, and, but Doug and I are more focused, you know, on riding quality horses than just scoring points, you know, and winning, you know, $5,000 claim, you know, like, I ride them and Doug, you know, doesn't really, like, care about putting me on those horses because, you know, winning is winning and for the owner and trainer, you know, it's very important, the, those everyday races, but uh, we are a little more focused, you know, on, like, stakes races and mm -hmm. if we have to go out of town, we will travel, you know. I'm going to go off point a little bit here. We were talking about Chicago and it really got me my, my mind working. Has Doug uh, taught you a little bit about the joys of being a Chicago Cubs fan yet? Is that something that you've discovered and uh, are enjoying this year? Is there, I think, currently 25 and 6, Joe, and in first lost, play? The lost to that. Oh, I don't hear that. Uh, now my day is run. Are you a Cubs fan yet, Flo? Uh, I am not, no. <laughs> baseball? Are you baseball? Does it mean. No, I'm not really watching really. Uh... Baseball and I'm watching a lot of uh, basketball and uh, and hockey and uh, and soccer and football too, you know. But like, no, being like Blackhawks hockey. Yeah, no, of course, yeah, Blackhawks. Blackhawks, of yeah. course, you know. There we go. But uh, you know the Chi Chicago Cubs, you know, uh, they've been losing for a long time. They didn't win a World Championship since like yeah, like nineteen nineteen oh five or who knows, you know. Oh no, you you know the stats. You know the history. Yes, but uh, no, I think um, the thing that for them, you know. Cops, you know, they have a great atmosphere, you know, great fans and very faithful, you know, uh, guys like Joe or Doug, you know, they've been losing for years and he's still sticking with them. Oh my god, oh my god, yeah. yeah, we can't do anything but root for the Cubs. So, Breeders' Cup, I, I, I am one of them, yes, I am one of them. Yeah, me too. Breeders' Cup, let's talk about that a little bit, Joe. Uh, work all week 2014, that broke, you broke through with a Breeders' Cup win. Last year, you had two wins, both on the turf. One was the sprint, a little bit of an upset with Mongolian Saturday. And then, of course, the wonderful, wonderful, and she's now three, the turf filly, Catch a Glimpse. And Catch a Glimpse is a filly that, that keeps on giving. I think she's run six, six, seven in a row now. Yes. Uh, yeah, the Brigas Cup was like um, very different, you know, because uh, first, you know, we rode, you know, a walk a week uh, on and off, you know, during his, uh, his career, you know. And, um, we were just lucky to stay on, you know, uh, at the right time, you know, and when he keep winning, and I was very good about it, you know, and especially after he won the Phoenix, you know, in uh, 2014 at Kinon, I'm like, he may have a chance to to win, you know, the Breeders' Cup, you know, because he won the prep and did really good and good time and good tactical speed and never run against great one, but. He's been well managed also, you know, by the trainer, always keeping him, like, easy, and when he came into the, the Breeders' Cup, he came with uh, all the confidence, you know, in the world. And, um, no, that was pretty cool, you know, just to win the Breeders' Cup, especially at Santa Anita, and I'm not based over there, I was just shipping in and just pretty much, you know, get the, the win and the money. You were, you were 14 posts that day? 14 posts, yeah, I was, uh, or 13, no? 13? Thirteen. It was way outside. Oh, yeah, way outside. Yeah, the, the, the I thirteen. Was I was. 13, yeah, 14. I was way outside and um, walked out to great You know, I was laying off just the the pace you know, uh, Bassano, and when he starts, you know, uh, getting tired at the top of the stretch, I just passed him and just uh, held on. Um, for some reason, you know, uh, uh, people think I'm a mile and a half, you know, a tough uh, jockey, but. So far, I've won uh, two Breeders' Cup, you know, uh, sprinting, so maybe that's, that's my thing, I don't know. It's that French blood, they want you to go a mile and a half on turf. Yeah, no, I guess, yeah, it's like the horses, you know, when uh, they are red for it, they're just sticking with it. And, um, no, it worked out good, and last year, you know, it was great. Uh, and all the Breeders' Cup came, like, with some luck, you know, uh, because without that, you know, we could play the races. And Mongol and Saturday, we picked him up, you know, uh, just the race, you know, before the the Breeders' Cup, actually, um, uh, the prep, you know, at Kinon. Mm -hmm. That's a horse I always had in my radar because he was based in Anton, 
And I always liked him because I remember, you know, like his first start of his career, you know, he went for like a man 25 and went very impressively. And from there, you know, he went from like an eight other day to like a three other day and against older and winning, you know, and you don't see that very often. A horse who's able to age one for eight other day, mm -hmm. who's winning a three other race, especially against <coughs> older. And from there, I'm like, well, that, that horse might be special, you know, to do that kind of stuff, you know. And from there, uh, the trainer, you know, uh, NLB Gumbach, always kind of like ask us to ride a horse, but we are so busy going everywhere in the country, you know, that somewhere that we can't ride a horse. And when he came down at Kinon and we are everybody, and we start walking the horse. And from there, you know, he, even right after the race, you know, he said, oh, I see you in the Breeders' Cup. And we didn't win that race, we finished second one, and that's the race that's been uh, taken over the turf. Mm -hmm. And from there, I felt like, eh, like he wants to put me in the British Cup and he felt confident in me I'm like I'm going to try and I don't know he just felt like I fit the horse pretty good and and uh, from there we got uh, we won and got the win you know and now catch a glimpse catch a glimpse you just won uh, the Derby weekend the Edgewood yeah the Edgewood yeah catch a glimpse same thing you know a very funny story actually uh, we went to Woodbine to ride a horse for uh, Michael Stillam you know uh, in the in the boys race and uh, from there uh, when in mount you know in the girls race like the uh, Natalia stakes mm -hmm. and from there you know a dog was on a mission you know to try to to find a mount you know not especially the winner but at least a mount since we we're going there and he made a few phone calls and a few people you know turned down actually uh, catch a glimpse you know that's how we get the mount and um, from there we won the race and no. Even, when, in the, even when we won, you know, uh, Mark Cassie could easily, you know, uh, put a different jockey you know, for the British Cup, you know, because it's not that we've been running the Philly before, or we've been walking the Philly or anything. And from there, you know, he felt confident, you know, like uh, letting us ride the, the Philly back, you know. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do uh, the right thing and uh, you guys put water for it, you know, and we get the win and he thought the Philly was really special and, like, you know, especially, you know, like, she has her tricks, you know, she has things her own way, and you don't, mm -hmm. like, feel the feeling well, and, you know, and we get the wins, and now plenty more, you know, came after that one. Plenty more came after that one. I think, uh, Joe, we, now would be a great time to uh, take a look back at one of those three Breeders' Cup wins, two Breeders' Cup wins last year alone for Florent Chirou. We're going to watch Catch a Glimpse as she wins the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Phillies 2015 at Keeneland. They're off in the juvenile Phillies turf. And there go Catch a Glimpse and Ruby Notion out to take the early lead together. Sapphire Kitten will settle into stride behind them. Guided to the inside by Julia Leferu to save ground. Four lengths off of these two leaders and they are motoring right along up front. Then a break of another two to Thrilled running in fourth position early on. Funneled on the outside by Harmonize as they make their way toward the back stretch. Alice Springs is a good seven lengths off the lead. In the first quarter was 24 and one fifth seconds. So they slowed things down a little bit here. And onto the back stretch they go. And it is Ruby Notion in front. Catch a glimpse on the outside second. A length and a half to Sapphire Kitten just off the leaders. Thrilled follows in fourth. Harmonize is fifth to the outside. Alice Springs is down toward the rail. Then Illuminate, followed by Gliding By. Price to perfection, Andrea's reward. Time in motion, Nemeralia. And in the back of the field are Mirage and Last Waltz. A 49 and one half mile. Into the turn, Ruby Notion and Rafael Hernandez lead the charge. Catch a glimpse is three quarters of a length behind. Second by another two. And then it's Sapphire Kitten third. Thrilled being ridden along to go in fourth on the outside. Harmonize is in contention, and Harmonize is only about four lengths off the lead. And Ryan Moore and Alice Springs are going to ride the rail to the top of the stretch, where Ruby Notion turns for home in front. Catch a glimpse on the outside is second. Alice Springs bottled up behind horses, looking to come on through an opening there. And then it's Sapphire Kitten to the outside. Frankie and Illuminator getting going too. They have Catch a Glimpse to catch. Laurent Giroux and Catch a Glimpse in front, close to home. And then it's Sapphire. Fire Kitten, Alice Springs on the inside, late move, Navaralia, catch, a glimpse, has done it! And then it was Alice Springs, Navaralia, and Sapphire Kitten in a final time of 1 minute, 39.08 seconds. For the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf, I've got the connections on my right. So that was uh, Florent Giroux winning the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Phillies support, catch a glimpse. 
And Catch a Glimpse, of course, is from a red hot barn. It's been hot for a few years now. That's the Mark Cassie, Norm Cassie barn. They have Catch a Glimpse, and I've heard her referred to actually as the three year old version of that great turf mare, Tappen. Tappen is written by another Frenchman for the Cassie barn, and that's Julien Laparreau. Cassie Barn using Frenchmen on these wonderful turf fillies. Is there is there any sort of connection there, or just a little bit of luck of the draw? Uh, probably luck of the draw, but uh, work out good for them. You know, I don't think I would change anything right now. You know, <laughs> plus you know, uh, we work good at also as a team. You know, uh, same thing. You know, when Julian you know, knows some horses he can't ride or whatever, uh, he just pretty much you know send us you know uh, our way, and and we do that. You know, the same thing. You know, we think. But um, now we've been very lucky, you know, for uh, Mark Cassie, you know, and all the team, you know, they always do a great job, you know, bring horses ready in the right spot. That's definitely an outfit, you know, you, you want to stick with, you know. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, Julian, Flavian Pratt had two stakes wins this past weekend. Do you feel a connection, a friendship, a bond with these guys kind of coming up through the ranks? I mean, Julian was before you. Uh, he was a sensational apprentice rider, and his career, you know, took off from there. Your path is a little bit different, but do you have that connection with those guys? Yes, no, definitely. You know, we are we are all friends. You know, to to begin with, and um, no, I would say you know, a French rider, you know, um, a well known, you know, all over all over the world. You know, maybe not you know in the, in the US, you know, but if you go in a, in Asia or whatever, you know, in the world in Dubai or. Whatever, you know, people you know, love you know, using uh, French writers. But um, uh, that was a little bit different you know, with Julian because he came here and was an apprentice and started you know, winning lots of races. But uh, Ju uh, Flavien and myself was a little bit different because we came here you know, without, uh, without the ball, you know. And uh, Flavien did good because he came a few times, you know, the winter time just to like see what was going on. And when he decided to come here, he already had the help, you know, of a great trainer, Richard Mandela, you know, to come under his way, you know, and just like uh, throwing some uh, nice animal you know, to wrap the bet. Right. And from there, you know, he just uh, didn't disappoint, you know, and keep uh, winning. And from now, you know, I'm very happy, you know, because he's doing great, you know, in California. And when we come here and somehow we can't ride a horse, uh, definitely, you know, try to send him uh, his way because I know he's going to try hard you know, on the horse and won't disappoint, you know, the, uh, the two of the horse. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you a question, Doug, and then we're going to be close to wrapping things up. I want to ask about how you manage everything. So now you're here at Churchill. Corey Landry wins the vast majority of the jockey titles here. Julian's off to a fast start. For what I mentioned earlier, he was kind of a little bit disappointed he never won a title at Arlington. But at the same time, on weekends, you're going to be traveling a lot, and it's almost like you have two circuits to deal with. You have your day-to-day -day racing at Churchill, but you have your national stake circuit as well. How do you manage all that? Do you think you have a chance to maybe win the title at Churchill this spring? It's a 10-week meet. Or do you just you know try to ride as many good horses as possible? I mean, we're, we're certainly focused on if by some chance we could actually win the title, we would love to do it. But is it a reasonable assumption that we could do it? Probably not. I mean, we're... We're going out of town. We went to Woodbine on Sunday. Fortunately, they were we were racing at, at Churchill on Sunday, so that prevented us from missing a whole car of races. But now we're we we like to ride in the big races, and when a Prairie Meadows or a Canterbury or an Indiana Downs or one of these tracks in the Midwest or pretty much anywhere now has a big day or a bunch of clumping of stakes, we're we're probably going to be there. Uh, we'll miss uh, next Friday and Saturday of Preakness Week just because we've got some, you know, really, really superb business there. So uh, you just kind of turn flip switches. I mean, I've got a calendar that I keep in my, uh, keep on me basically. It's on my possession and I'm constantly updating it where uh, that particular day there's no shot I'm going to be at Churchill. So let's see if we can get some out somewhere else or uh, vice versa, you know. Tell our audience, because this is a show where we like to give people information they wouldn't normally get, give us a horse on Preakness Weekend that you're really excited about. Uh, very, very excited about a horse called Cinco Charlie, 
and we'll be running in the, uh, the dirt sprint there. And uh, Farah has actually won on him, and they have a real good rapport, and uh, I, I think that horse will be pretty saucy. Right? Yeah. 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 Alright, cool. Anything else? Talented sprinter. I like Cinco Charlie a yeah. lot. Good luck to you, Florent. A big weekend uh, coming up next weekend at Pimlico. Folks, that's another Triple Crown, Triple Crown Insider webcast here on Horse Racing Nation. I'd like to really thank Florent Giroux and his agent, Doug Bradar, for being here with Joe and I. And we hope to see you next week. As always, we'll be back Wednesday with some more great guests. Thanks, guys. Derby Wars webcast coming thank up. You. Derby Wars webcast. Joe, say it. Derby Wars webcast coming up, so we're going to take a short break. We're going to go live to the contest in uh, just a few minutes, so uh, stick around and hopefully enjoy the show.